Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Zones Review. Uh, today I have a speaker review for you. Um, even if you're not interested in speaker, I thought it would be a good video for you all to watch because it goes through the uh, methodology for measurements and, and listening tests. So today's uh, speaker in question, actually let me go back full screen, um, is this Genelec 8050B, um, Finnish company. Um, been in business making professional monitors for a long time, probably top two or three brand in the world. Um, this specific sample is quite large, eight inch woofer. It's quite heavy actually, it may not look it, but it's made out of cast aluminum and it's quite a solid box. Uh, if we go to the review, you'll be able to see a better picture of it. Uh, it's got this integrated waveguide. Uh, waveguide is a way to uh, narrow the response of a tweeter to get it to match the woofer's response as it, the frequencies go up. The woofer starts, uh, step back, woofer starts with basically omnidirectional sound, but as frequency go up, it becomes narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, the inverse is true of the tweeter. If you just cross over to a tweeter, uh, tweeter starts off also quite wide and you get a discontinuity there. So what a waveguide wave guide does is that it narrows the response of a Twitter at crossover region so that it smoothly matches the, that of the woofer. Uh, if you have a mid-range, that's another way to, uh, mid-range drivers, another way to solve the problem. But if, if you don't have one, trying to get a tiny little, uh, um, oops, a tiny little uh, Twitter to, uh, uh, blend in properly with a woofer is, is next to impossible. So it's nice to see this in there. Um, you know, a number of companies have these uh, wave guys in there. This is a powered monitor, has uh, is bi amplified, so it has an amplifier for the woofer and has an amplifier for the tweeter. It's an older design, um, so unlike the new speakers where they all use Class D amplifiers, this uses traditional Class A B amps. Um, and uh, they tend to not be as powerful as the Class Ds are because they take a lot of space in, in the, with heat sink and what have you. Uh, on the back, you have a pretty good size uh, port. Uh, the port is there to extend the low frequency response, in a, especially in a small enclosure like this. Uh, but then they tend to drop off like a rock uh, afterwards. Um, so there, you know, it's almost, there's no free lunch there, if you will. Uh, but it's, you know, 95% of speakers now in, in this bookshelf size will have that. Has a number of controls uh, for uh, adjusting the uh, frequency response. I tend to not want to use any of those. I use electronic equalization in, in my software because these things are very static and I like to tune the sound fully. But uh, if you need to just plug it in and use it, then it's fine. It's got an input sensitivity. I set it to the minimum and still was pretty sensitive. I had to keep the volume pretty low. Anyway, that's the speaker. Um, we're going to get into the measurements. The measurements here uh, for a speaker, a proper way to measure a speaker is to make sure that the room reflections are not there. Uh, you don't want to see a frequency response that is specific to my room. You want to know how the speaker itself behaves. And that traditionally has meant that you take the speaker and you go to an anechoic chamber that uh, gets rid of the reflections and you measure there. But even anechoic chambers, um, anything of a reasonable size is still not anechoic, uh, meaning that as frequencies get lower and lower, it actually has some reflections that come back to the mic measurement microphone and screw up the measurements. There are calibrations for that um, and they mostly work, but just know that in very low frequencies, even anechoic measurements are not very accurate. I use a system called uh, Clipple uh, Near Field Scanner. It's a robotic system. Let me open the link. Uh, hopefully there's a good picture of it there. And uh, you can see in here, enlarge this. You put the uh, speaker in the middle and uh, uh, the system will then use this uh, boom and uh, it will scan the speaker and take a cylindrical measurements from top to bottom. And then uh, if you instruct it to get rid of the uh, uh, reflections in a room, it will do a second pass 
and using the, the those two measurements, you can determine if a sound is coming from the speaker or it's coming from an outside the wall and you come back in. Uh, if it comes back from another direction, it will uh, take it out of the system. Um, because of that, uh, it has two benefits. One is that it measures very close distance to the speaker. And the benefit of that is that if there's ambient noise, it doesn't matter. That's one of the benefits of a well-done anechoic chamber is that it's very quiet. This system does not require a quiet room uh, because the microphone is very close to the speaker. And as a result, the uh, noise is dwarfed and, and doesn't show up in the measurement. Um, there's a problem with doing that in that if you measure very close to the speaker, you're measuring what is called a near field response, not the far field response where the sound is gotten integrated. And, but this system mathematically will calculate what that sound field is at any distance. So even though it measures at a short distance, it can project the sound at one meter, 10 meter, 100 meters, whatever you want. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so putting it all together, it gives you a, basically a measurement that is uh, uh, more accurate than just about any other method that you could come up with. You could go spend a million dollars on an anechoic chamber and not get this kind of result. Uh, nothing's free in life, and this one literally is not free. Uh, this that system that I show you with all the bells and whistles that I use to make the proper measurements costs about a hundred thousand dollars. So it's not for faint of heart. But I, you know, when I decided to get into speaker measurements, I just didn't know how else to do it. You have to do it this way uh, to get proper measurements. There are DIY techniques that you can put things on the ground and measure and combine measurements, and that's what some of the other magazines and the websites use. It's very time consuming and uh, to do it right takes a lot of you know meticulous attention. Uh, I do a speaker review every other day, every third day, and uh, there's just no way I could uh, measure a speaker like that um, you know using the other people's methods. And you'll see why it's not just one measurement. By default, I have the uh, Clippo NFS system measure 1,000 points. So it is sampling the sound field 1,000 points around. It can go higher and can go lower. Lower can lose, uh, can cause accuracy errors. Uh, higher takes a lot longer to run, but I have tested some speakers uh, with 2,000 points. Um, 2,000 points takes about four and a half hours for measurements. Uh, 1,000 points, half of that, about two and a half hours. And then another 15 minutes of number crunching afterwards. So just the raw measurement takes me about three, three and a half hours uh, on the system. Once there, we don't just get a simple frequency response measurement. Uh, we get this beautiful graph. And this graph and the measurements is in the standard NC standard and also called CEA or CTA 2034. Um, but the common name for it, we call the spin data or spinorama. And I highly encourage you to use the word spin data because this sounds like you know more than you do. So don't spell it out. When you go to somebody try to sell a speaker, just say, you have spin data? And the guy says, what? You want to walk out because they don't, they don't know how to measure this. Um, anyway, uh, Dr. Toole, when he was at National uh, Research Council in, in Canada that was set up to try to promote an audio industry in Canada, set up a, in the 70s, uh, 1970s, tried to uh, figure out, you know, do people, is there some common theme to what speakers people like, or is it just a free-for-all that, you know, there's no commonality, you build different frequency response, different tonality, and X group of people like it, and the other people hate it. And surprisingly, it turned out to be that uh, vast majority of people like the same thing. And not only do they like the same thing, but they like a neutral sound when it comes to frequency response. So if you look at this uh, response over here, there's this top line says on axis, which is the, I don't know if you can see this black line on top here. And the research says that we want this thing to have to basically be flat and have no variations in it. Now, this speaker is extremely good. It comes within 80, 90% of, of that target of uh, looking flat. It's got little notches up and down. There are more perfect speakers, professional speakers, and they all use DSP to filter out these notches in and out. This speaker is older and it doesn't do that. Newer Genelex do that, and they have flatter response. But from audibility point of view, a little bit higher, a little bit lower, it's just not material because the music's recorded with no standards. So who knows if the 
track you listen to has a little dip over here versus this little peak. Uh, so if you like, you can try to filter these things and correct them. But once you get to this level, it's good enough in my book. Now that's just on axis, meaning the direct sound coming at your ear. So that's one sound. It's a very important sound. It's this sets the stage and the tonality that your brain perceives of a speaker. But the speaker also sends sound to in all directions. And it hits the ceiling, hits the floor, hits the wall behind you, then goes back, hits the front wall. And all these sounds also come to you at different arrival times. And the brain has this uh, challenge that not only does it hear this, the direct sound, but it also hears the reflected sound and it hears the reflected sound differently in the right ear versus the left ear. So if there is reflection on the right, it will come to my right ear faster and also stronger than it comes to my left ear. And then my face also will cast an acoustic shadow where some of the high frequencies won't go to this ear as well as they go in this ear. Now, if the ear try to just present both of those images to your uh, to you, you go nuts, right? It's like you know frogs. I uh, think frogs see you know uh, images that are you know ghostly images with their eyes. That would be cool to that with the sound where your ear will be hearing many many sounds simultaneously. That would make us nuts. So from um, point of view of of how we've evolved as species, our brain had decided to. Uh, um, uh, filter out all those other secondary sounds. Now, the best job that he can do is if those secondary sounds have similar tonalities to what the direct sound is. If that's the case, the brain says, oh, these are just reflections of the same thing, uh, and therefore they're not informationally as important, if you will, and that uh, I'm not going to present them as secondary data to you. And it is, for lack of a better word, it's happier. So an ideal speaker will have a direct sound that comes to you with a certain frequency response, but also it's indirect sound that hits the walls and come to you and through other reflections also have similar frequency response. Now they don't have to have identical frequency response. And indeed, it's usually the case where their frequency response tilts down because that Twitter at high frequency, just like that woofer that I explained, it also starts to narrow down. And when it narrows down, there's less energy hitting the walls and coming at you. So, uh, you know, some, some high frequency droop is fine. Now, not all reflections are the same. Some reflections are stronger than the others. First reflections are the strongest. So a reflection of the sidewall coming to my ear is stronger than a reflection hitting a back wall, hitting the sidewall, then coming to me. There's a group of um, reflections that, uh, uh, let me just jump ahead a little bit, called early reflections and involved uh, a research that was done at Harman, which was they sampled a few different listening rooms and determined which are the most, the strongest reflections that combine and arrive at you. They're dominant in signature. And they're the floor, obviously. There's a ceiling front wall, side walls, rear wall, and then some of all of those together. And as you can see for this Genelec, uh, if I sum all those together, I get a pretty nice smooth sloping down curve as I mentioned we would. However, we also have a dip here, which is at the crossover region. So this speaker is not as perfect as it could be. Um, again, newer Genelecs will not have this kind of dip in them, or you know, most perfect speaker wouldn't have any. The, uh, if we take the, uh, 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 step back, we can take this information that I've talked so far that is captured in an anechoic chamber and actually predict what sound you would get in a typical room. And that brings us down to this estimated uh, or predicted in-room response. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, it's a mix of different things, but predominantly is the on-axis sound, which I said is, extremely important. This early window, which we know is tilting down. So as a result, when we add the two together, the final thing will tilt down. And then some of the base uh, area comes from what is called sound power, which is this, um, going back, this uh, dashed red line. 
and that sound power is just sound everywhere and bass is everywhere. So if you combine all of those things together and make this do, you get a predicted in-room response. And a predicted in-room response in here says we have a tilt down, although pro monitors tend to have less of a tilt because they believe in a flatter response for somebody using a pro monitor for mixing music than you would listen for hi-fi. Although I find this one, it's got decent amount of tilt. Uh, but the formula of how much tilt you need, that's to taste. You know, you may like less highs, somebody else may like more highs. Um, but as a general rule, monitors tend to have less of a tilt in there. And here we see that our main flaw is this little dip in here. So if it didn't have this, this is extremely good response. Okay. Let me go back to a graph that I skipped over, which is these... Um, individual driver responses. So my fancy system with a thousand measurements generated the graphs that you saw. But I also do a simple test where I use a robotic boom and I bring it point blank in front of each element that radiates sound in a speaker and just measure what comes out of it. So in case of a tweeter, it's this um, blue line that you see, a teal line. I brought the microphone right in front of a tweeter and ran a full 20 to 20,000 sweep. You see that it shows the high frequencies of a tweeter and it drops, but then it goes back up and appears to show that there's bass response. There isn't. So when I have the microphone up here, this guy is also playing because there's no way for me to isolate these drivers uh, without tearing up the uh, speaker. So the bass still goes up and pollutes that. So you want to ignore, when you look at my graphs in here, you want to ignore when it lifts back up and, and for a tweeter that response is, is not coming out of Twitter. So just ignore everything from this 1.5 kilohertz down for the Twitter. I then do the same thing with the woofer. A good thing about a woofer is that when I measure that, this guy is pretty directional. The Twitter is pretty directional. So when I'm measuring the woofer, the Twitter doesn't pollute it hardly at all. So for the woofer, we see this red line comes down during the crossover region. And down here, you know, response gets, you know, messy because the woofer isn't designed to produce good response at high frequencies. But luckily our level is way below that of the Twitter. So Twitter sound dominates. But some of these peaks and valleys that you've seen here, maybe the reason our frequency response isn't perfectly flat in these things, these little ticks that you see, you know, it is the sum total of these peaks and stuff. The third radiating element is the port. So I put the microphone all the way behind it and do the same measurement. And here we see the port. And we see how it helps the low frequency response. So this is the woofer. It loses its response base as the frequencies go down. But then the port kicks in and gives it a lift up here around uh, 40 hertz. Okay. So these two sum together and basically give you a flat response that then rolls off down here. Um, all ports, unfortunately, have an artifact, which we call resonances, so sound can bounce up and down inside there and amplify. So a port normally would have this response, and you can see that it keeps going down, which is what we want. And then all of a sudden, it perks back up and starts to generate a lot more energy. It goes back down and has some other, because you have modes that are horizontal and vertical and you know, in all different dimensions. And it has yet another one up here. And uh, these are actually fairly controlled. In some cheap speakers, I find resonances coming all the way up very close to the response of the uh, woofer or the Twitter. And as a result, you get peaking in the frequency response due to that resonance, which doesn't sound good. So um, uh, here, there's, they're controlled. But there are enough in here, little peaks in here, but it, to, again, cause this little humps that you see in the frequency response. And usually you can tell the resonances when the humps are repeated in all three curves. You can see these three are repeated. And if we go down here, yeah, we can see them over here. This is the resonance. So typically pulling those down helps with clarity, I find. Um, these resonances are little sinking, you know, little birds inside the speaker. They get activated and all of a sudden they sing along. and you know, if they're high, as you can pull them. Now, again, this is just one or two dB, so I would not worry about it. So, so far, the assessment's quite good, but we're not done. The science sort of ends here and says that, look, tonality is everything in a speaker. Tonality is everything 
in a speaker in that it dominates preference. So if I have two speakers, one has boomy bass, the other one doesn't have boomy bass, you're not gonna like the one with the booming bass. It doesn't matter if it has lower distortion and Twitter or somewhere else. If it's going or it's too much bass or it's too bright, you're not gonna pay attention to anything else about that speaker because it's just too bright. <clears throat> this is a controlled blind test. So, but if we have two excellent speakers, with similar frequency response, similar you know, early window, similar everything, in my opinion then distortion matters and we wanna measure that and we wanna find the limits of a speaker. Uh, know that distortion measurements are somewhat tricky in that they can be impacted by reflections, which I can also fix. And you know, the science there of how you measure distortion is uh, you know, it's not the most perfect thing. So don't be horrified about some of these graphs that you see. So I make two measurements for um, distortion. One of them at 86 dB SVL, the other one's 96. This 96 is similar to um, Soundstage Network that uses NRC's anechoic chamber for distortion measurements. They reported at 90, I reported at 96, but it's exactly the same level. Um, but then I thought when I first started doing this that not all speakers um, do well with, uh, are able to produce 96 dB SBL. Uh, so I do one at 86 dB. Uh, so we have both. What's nice about both is that we can see whether distortion is proportional to level or all of a sudden we have elements that go nuts, uh, if you will. Here, we actually have very good uh, distortion in that now you might say, whoa, distortion is shooting up above that. But at very low frequencies, our hearing is not very sensitive. So those harmonic distortions that we're showing in here are not uh, audible, certainly not at 86 dB SPL. When we increase volume to 96 dB, which is the one on the right, we can see the bass gets worse. And that's always just like physics. Uh, speaker's most perfect when it's not moving. The moment you move it, it's voice coil and magnet geometry changes, and the response is just not as linear. It's The more you push it, the less linear it gets. It's just happier when, happiest when it's not producing sound. <laughs> so we increase this and so on. We can see all those other peaks in here also go up, but still pretty controlled. There is a peak in here that we discussed in the forum um, that does go nuts over here. And the uh, people thought it's related to a resonance of that Twitter at 27 kilohertz. And that this measurement, I can get confused thinking that's the second harmonic of, of something at 13 and a half kilohertz. Uh, it sounds plausible to me. Um, if it is a 27 kilohertz resonance, then there is no real audible distortion in here. It's happening above our hearing range. Now, this you're not going to see this kind of measurement elsewhere. Uh, most people don't show it like this, and NRC certainly doesn't show it like this. But I find that this kind of distortion, uh, as shown as a percentage over here, and as a linear scale, is very revealing because we can see the small and we can sort of predict that this is shooting up. The more common display people have is uh, showing the distortion as an absolute level uh, together with frequency response. So if I put the two together, you can see, you know, their relative scales to each other. But I find that this is a hard graph to remember. It's very busy and so forth. Um, but we still have our little peak over here and we have our bass distortion. In crappy speakers, this bass distortion can actually shoot up above our frequency response, which means the distortion is above 100%. When that happens, I guarantee if you play anything in this low bass region, that speaker distorts like nobody's business. So it's good when there's a gap in here between these two. Um, I have made an arbitrary decision to have 50 dB as the threshold for fantastic speaker. Don't ask me to justify it. <laughs> it just is. And great speakers come very close. And you can see in here above 100 hertz, the speaker essentially uh, has no distortion. And if this is not real, then you know from 100 hertz uh, on, this is extremely good distortion. Distortion comes in bass, low bass, and it just there's no way around it. Other than much larger speakers, many more drivers that they don't have to move as much. So when I've measured tower speakers that are properly designed, these distortions are lower. But this is a small boss, got one driver and it's got to move, and the more it moves, the more uh, distortion we get.
Okay, so overall, we're 90, 95% good, good news over here. The next um, uh, display, the graph is a pretty critical one. It says if we keep the loudness the same, what will, how wide, what happens to the width of, a, of that level? An ideal speaker that just sends a shaft of sound to you with no variation based on frequency will, will look like these two lines over here. We don't have an ideal speaker here, but we have a darn good one. And we can see this red curve, which is where sound drops off 6 dB, is almost hugging my two ideal lines in here. They're, they're not symmetrical because when I measure the speaker, I can't always align it perfectly. So assume that they are symmetrical. So this is a response to a very good speaker. What does this mean in practice? It means I can go to the left and I can go to the right and have the sound drop off 6 dB, yet tonality won't change. And that's a cool thing, in a, in especially in a near field uh, setting where you're you know, mixing, recording, editing, sound, and you're gonna move around left and right, the client may be sitting next to you, and you want everybody to hear the same sound. You don't want all of a sudden the highs to drop off like a rock when you move a few inches left and right. So horizontal directivity is very important. It's called directivity, which means how is the sound being controlled? And that waveguide that I talked about causes this middle region to be so perfect and so nice. So it means the handoff from woofer to the Twitter is essentially perfect. And the nice thing about getting this, and if I go out, I can also show this as a heat map contour thing, and you see the same thing. You see this you know, red area is the loudest sound, and you can see how smooth this is. And what's nice about this is that when you get this kind of sound, it means that the speaker is what I call room friendly. Because the reflections have the same tonality as a direct sound, it's okay to have reflections. And side reflections actually could be beneficial from a reference point of view because they'll take a speaker and broaden its, its uh, location. And what that does is that instead of a sound coming from one little point source, it comes out of a sort of a, uh, a wider region between it and, and the wall. And the spatial quality is something that people like in controlled uh, settings. In uh, studios, people tend to absorb all the reflections but just know that you have the option of not absorbing reflections unless they're needed. And if you go back to my um, previous graph in here, you can actually tell which reflections you want to absorb, which ones you don't. Um, a ceiling bounce in here is the red one. You can see this dip that we have. We prefer to not have a dip. What's the cause of a dip? It's because the ceiling response is pretty weak in this area. So sound shooting up from this guy going up is a little weak in this region. So, if you can put an absorber on your ceiling or have a tall ceiling, that means you'll have less of this dip. Most of the time I find that the floor bounce um, blue is a problem. You can see the floor bounce also goes down and is also responsible for that. So in 99% of cases, I recommend having a thick carpet on the floor, a uh, shaggy carpet with something with uh, <laughs> some depth to it because you're trying to absorb frequencies from 1000 Hertz up and you need about one or two inches there for effective absorption there. So most of the time you want to have the floor reflect, absorbed and if you can with the ceiling, do the same. Uh, rest of the reflections on this speaker are so good, there's no reason to absorb them, you know, and indeed if you absorb too much, you wind up building a very dead room that's not good for enjoyment of music. Now, this is horizontally. We're measuring the, you know, what the reflections are on each side. We can also measure reflections up and down, and that's how we determine what the reflections look like for ceiling and floor. And there we see the pictures still quite good for a two-way speaker. Two-way speakers tend to be quite chewed up, and this guy is very, very smooth, except for this hole that it has, and you know, sometimes we call these crab eyes or lobster eyes. Um, and these you'll see. So there's a hole in here that says, look, if you go too far above the speaker or too far, I mean, Twitter, but actually the reference axis for this is right at the edge of the woofer. If you go too far above this or too far below this, you're, you fall in these two ditches. And the moment you fall into those two ditches at two kilohertz, you'll get a much more pronounced dip. 
and you don't want that obviously two killers super important uh, audible range and you don't want to have a dip so if we look to the left in here we see that if you, you can go above 20 degrees up and about 30 degrees or 40 degrees low and you're still okay so general advice for this thing should be that it's at ear height that way if you slouch a little bit and you go up a little bit it's still cool if it's placed much higher than that tilt them down so that the on axis is sent to you so know that the on axis is the cleanest sound and it is for most speakers so if you're going to tilt the speaker some other way, know that you're not listening to the best sound of the speaker. A few speakers are designed where the off axis is better. Usual because of some flaw on axis and they want you to tilt it a little bit. But as a general rule, speakers should be tilted directly at you. And if you don't like the tonality, use equalization to fix it. But uh, here you have as much freedom as you can get. The only speakers that are perfect um, in this regard are coaxial versions and in the general like higher end ones use coaxial drivers with twitter sitting inside the woofer so whether you look at it vertically or horizontally it makes no difference uh, we have this problem because as we go up or down the time difference between these two changes and how they add up and subtract changes whereas horizontally the two are the same distance and we get a much better nice response when the tweeter's inside the woofer, then it's a coaxial thing and, uh, you know, it tracks well. Now, just making a coaxial driver doesn't mean the sound is better. There, there may be other compromises, power capability, and there may be other issues. Sticking a tweeter inside a woofer that's moving uh, has, can have its own problems. General ones are done extremely well, and I've reviewed those. But don't just assume that you want a coaxial driver. It's... Uh, uh, it's got a stronger marketing message than a technical one. The design has to be right. I uh, also run a waterfall. This, this display can be extremely misleading and I don't show it for non-active uh, speakers. I know that I can muck with the parameters of this and make the display anything I wanted to show. Uh, I do tune it a little bit. So in this case, we see the port resonances that uh, we'd seen earlier. But other than, hmm, that's all <laughs> you want to go past this, this, the, this waterfall display. People fall in love with it because it's so pretty, but know that its prettiness factors far more than its usefulness. Um, the hardcore objective is on ASR forum don't like the fact that I listen to speakers. They say, the measurements say everything. Uh, as much as I, I've measured, I don't know, 140 speakers in, in 14 months, so I'm quite trained to what speakers sound like because I listen to them so often and I'm always comparing measurements to listening tests. But I tell you though, there are things I listen for in listening tests that not measured. And um, I always say electronics are 100% by what the measurements are. Speakers are about 80, 90% uh, measurements predict the final outcome. And headphones are about 60 to 70 or maybe 80%. So depending on the headphone, uh, the measurements may be excellent or may be you know, not so excellent. And therefore, you got to fill the gap with something. And I fill the gap with speakers and headphones by listening. And uh, you can ignore it if it really bothers you and you say, oh, I'm all about objective stuff and all about the graph, more power to you ignore this section but i want to be the person that does a sanity check on the measurement and say okay well, you know we have this frequency response and it's got these you know little imperfections in it are those audible are they not audible do they need fixing and if they need fixing i build equalization for it and then i'm able to turn the filters on and off instantly and i can quickly determine whether i like the sound with them on or without them you might say, well, you're biased. Maybe you like something and you don't. So, all right, you can do the same thing. You should set up the same EQ, you turn them on and off. If you see that they improve sound, then great. You have, I've already done the work for you. Um, and by the way, I don't go correct every little niggling things. I correct major errors. In this case, I turned on this Genelec and played my reference list. I have a Revelle system, so on two speakers. And I have a long list of tracks that I think are great demo material. I'll run them against this, just as beautiful. 
two different companies with two different brands, two different products, two different approaches, yet they both follow the same research that says, hey, make on axis flat and make off axis as similar as you can to that. When you do that, the same music sounds just as beautiful and just as familiar to me. So to me, uh, close my eyes, I may tell you that's a Ravel speaker, it's not a Genelec. That's the beauty of standards, that's the beauty of research. So in this case, one of the few cases where I turned it on, sounded great, I said, hey, why even bother uh, doing an EQ? Now, normally that would then say that I'm gonna give it my highest ranking, which will be the golfing or the soccer uh, Panthers in the review, but you didn't see that. You saw the one that says, I like it. Why is that? Right when I was gonna finish and go take pictures of the speaker, I got to a bass heavy track and I turned it up and I was like, whoa, what is that? What is that? I noticed that the uh, uh, a bass drum hit would go boom at low volume, then it would go boom at a little bit higher volume, and if you turn the volume way up, you go boom, boom. Uh, sorry, I can't repeat the sound uh, any better than that. But basically, it, it felt like a feedback loop where the bass is trying to go up, and someone's pulling it down, then letting it go up, letting it go up. Instead of one clean bass hit. It would go, blah, 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 blah. and the more you pushed it, the louder it got, the worse the distortion was. Quite audible. This is not some, oh, it's a placebo effect. No, there's nothing. I mean, it's just, you just crank it up. Now, granted, this was loud volume, and I'm only listening to one speaker with two speakers, it would be twice as loud, so I wouldn't have to crank it up. So I would say at low to medium, then to moderately high level, you're not going to have this issue. But it doesn't have limitless power. And that's the number one failure I find in most powered monitors is that they have this limit. I think it's mostly due to amplification and limiters they put in there. And indeed the clipping light that turns red on this and it did exactly that. So uh, when I heard the distortion, except for the slight amount, it wouldn't come on. But the moment I turned it up to even a little bit past that, that light would blink. And during my testing at 96 dB SPL, that distortion thing, and low frequency, that light came on solid and you shut off. So in my view, the amplifier in it is not powerful enough. Uh, you need a subwoofer. Luckily, if you just roll it off past 40 hertz, I mean, below 40 hertz, then it's happy. So, you know, you just need a sub to fill in that sub base area, which I value a ton, you may not. And um, so, it is not what I call the ideal speaker. Um, I've tested one or two speakers that are ideal. Actually, the uh, JBL 708P is the first powered speaker I've tested that has no limit. Meaning, as much as I like loud sound for testing and deep bass, I could not get that speaker to bottom out, um, whereas this one I did. So. General like makes larger speakers, more powerful ones. They have some insane looking ones. So obviously they don't want to have this little guy be, you know, everything, uh, even if they could. So, and part of that, maybe this class A, B amps are just anemic. They have the power rating, but I don't trust their power rating. I think they're saying it's 150 watts or so, 150 watt, what? I mean, it's, it's not a peak power, some fake number, what distortion, I don't know. So anyway, um, if you don't try to go nuts with this as far as volume, it's a fantastic speaker, beautiful tonality, warm sound, great low distortion sound. It's just fantastic. I mean, I have no complaints at all. Very good bass, by the way, when it's producing them without distortion. I mean, it's just a great speaker. It's not cheap. It's a build made in uh, you know Europe. They're $1,400 each. I think, and go up, uh, $1,900 each. So a pair of them will set you back $3,800. But other than max power, trying to put together this kind of performance in passive speakers will be very hard. I mean, to get two speakers to have this kind of performance and amplifiers to drive them and everything is very hard. So in general, powered speakers just rule the world from this size down if you don't need insane levels. Trying to you know match them with passive speakers are very hard um, because you know they just have a more optimal design. They have two amplifiers, electronic crossovers. There's no losses there, and much more optimized. And if they have DSP in them, they just get so perfect that it's very hard to replicate that.
So anyway, uh, this has gotten to be a very long video, almost 40 minutes, so I won't keep going. Um, by the way, for speakers, there's a preference score that gets computed by one of the members. Um, the preference score can misfire. It's also not for near field, but it's got a very high score for the speaker of 6.3. Anything in sixes is essentially state-of-the-art. I forget what our highest number is, maybe 6.7. It can misfire. I can show you two speakers with identical score, and you wouldn't say that they're they're the same. Is you know this science is good, but it's not excellent. So I don't compute it for that reason. But uh, for speakers, you do want to you know sort of look at this and maybe rule out anything that's extremely poor in in this preference score. Okay, hopefully you got a good sense of how speaker measurements and testing is done by Audio Science Review. Text version of this review is available and for this and, as I mentioned, 130 other speakers. Okay, hopefully uh, you didn't fall asleep <laughs> during this video. <laughs> See you in uh, future episodes. Bye-bye.